In this week's update, modest correction or is this a real danger of something larger? Major rotation trade continues and exploiting the cycles. My name's Gary Davis. As always, this is general advice only. And please remember to like and subscribe to the video. All right, well, we've had the continuation of the big rotation, uh, more selling in tech, particularly on Wednesday when the, the Google and Tesla results came in. And look, really, big tech was in a position where a correction couldn't be unexpected. We had premium prices to technical patterns. So in simplicity, the prices were well above short-term moving averages. So just begging for some sort of pullback. We also had premium prices to historical multiples, and the market had been trying to anticipate just how good earnings would be, and they disappointed just a little bit so far. There's still a long way to go in earnings season, but Google's results were just a little less than what the market was looking for. And so when you're trading at a premium, that was all that was needed to accelerate the selling. So I think it was very much about big tech had been bought on the expectation that the earnings momentum would continue. And when that either came through pretty much as expected or maybe disappointed just a little bit, everyone hit the sell button, the algorithms kicked in and down it went. But look, there's a bit more going on than just a sell off on earnings as I'll get to. Mm. So we saw the continuation of funds being reallocated into what is a pretty healthy rotation trade because it was never healthy for the market to be going up on the back of just a handful of very large stocks. So this is actually very, very healthy for the overall market. But the backdrop, importantly, the backdrop to keep the American market buoyant at the index and at the sector level is still there. So, you know, there's no reason for any drastic changes, but certainly there is a rotation that can be taken advantage of. So the tailwinds for growth remain very powerful, particularly in the big tech area. You know, those, those things aren't going away. It's just prices had, had got ahead of themselves. It's highly likely now the bond market is signaling that US rate cuts starting in September and now highly likely, I think it's something like 87% likelihood of a quarter percent cut in September and probably another couple before the year end. It's going to be a real messy period between here and the November election because the economic policies and the foreign policies of the two possible outcomes of the election are very different, very different and very unpredictable. Trump, of course, is unpredictable at the best of times. And, you know, Harris, we just, other than the fact that she is very left-leaning, no one really knows what she's going to do because she's a bit of a shifting entity in terms of policy. So there really is a lack of uncertainty. And I think that may be reflected in the markets between now and November. But after we know the result, then I think the clarity will be very good for markets. Small caps offer far better value and have done for, for multiple years. And that's really starting to come through very strongly now. So far, earnings season has been okay, but we need more data and we're going to get that next week, big week next week in America. So the question will be, will those earnings come through? Will they be good enough to sustain sentiment? Now, big tech, of course, far from dead, but there are some outside forces that are amplifying the rotation. Outside forces, I mean by outside the equities market. And there is things happening in the bond market and the currency markets that do impact equities and can sig significantly impact equities. So you might see some things going on with individual stocks that look completely irrational. And frankly, they've got nothing to do with the merits of those stocks. It's just there are pressures outside that are changing the money flows. And one of those is something called the yen carry trade, which has been going on for years, where the yen is effectively sold and those money flows find their way into the US equities market. Now, for various reasons that it's not necessary for me to go into, there is a pretty good chance that that trade could be unwinding because of the shifting policies of the Bank of Japan and the Fed with respect to interest rates. And if that does get legs, then that certainly will change the money flows 
and particularly impact big tech, but also impact some other parts of the US market. So that's just a bit of a warning flag that I think warrants just a bit more caution than perhaps has been the case in the last um, six months or so. So that's one to watch. And if there's some strange things happening in the markets, it won't necessarily be about the earnings of equity. It could just be factors from outside. And that could be partly behind the big selling in, in Google and Tesla. Tesla was probably pretty warranted. Google, I thought, was a little excessive, given, uh, given all the circumstances. Yes, they're not quite getting the return that the market wanted on their massive expenditure uh, in, uh, in AI, but uh, it seemed a little excessive, and that, that could be part of it. There were also numerous other stocks that did report that seemed to have outsized uh, sell-offs on, on results that beat expectations and, and beat them easily um, and raised guidance and expressed very positive outlooks. And the share price is still sold off anyway. And it was just one of those weeks. Now, beyond the, the short to medium term dangers, don't switch off because AI isn't going away. Big tech isn't going away. So some of the world's greatest wealth compounders, Google and Apple and NVIDIA, et cetera, are, are going on sale. Now, whether that's next week, next month, or early next year, I have no idea, but I know what it looks like. So you know, do not switch off. Do not move from the excessive hype position around AI to going negative, which I think some of the media is already starting, for pardon me, to turn to. So big opportunity. It's a matter of just simply broadening. There are so many stocks in America that are trending very, very powerfully and are producing terrific results and are not expensive at all in the small and mid cap area of the market. So turning to a summary of the American stocks, the S&P was down 0.8%. So this is just a continuation of what we've seen now for about a month. The S&P down, the NASDAQ down a lot more, but the equal weight S&P actually went up a little bit this week and the Russell was up 3.4%. So that's been clearly the big story of the last three or four weeks. And I'll show you a pretty graphic chart on that in just a minute. Now, the, the situation in America really... It would be hard to dial up something that's, that's more positive. Economic growth is accelerating. It's above expectations. And it's a lot on the back of the consumer. So the consumer would appear to be in reasonably good shape. Either that or they're blowing their credit cards out of the water. And then on top of that, we've got disinflation as well is on track. The personal consumption expenditure, which is the Fed's favorite indicator that they watch, fell from 3.4% annualized to 26 so it's just ticking all the boxes in terms of the economic setup. US dollar index was mildly higher, pushed up about 0.2 to 104.3. The 10-year yield is reflecting what the bond market is expecting, and that's rate cuts, so down to 4.2. And the VIX had a real roller coaster from somewhere around 13 to 18 and back to 16, which is where it started. So let's jump in and look at some charts. And this is the, the first one to look at. This is the NASDAQ versus IWM, which is the Russell 2000 for small caps. And you can see this is over the last 12 months. So the NASDAQ had significantly outperformed. The gap had got very, very wide up until the 10th of July. And then there was an abrupt shift, which is what, two weeks ago, two and a bit weeks ago. And since then, there's been a dramatic convergence between the NASDAQ and the Russell. And if we, as that rotation took hold, and if we put this, let's just zoom in and look at the last month, you can see just the dramatic shift between the larger cap stocks in the NASDAQ, which is obviously heavily in influenced by what happens with the Magnificent Seven and the rest of the small cap market. And there really are some stunning trends unfolding in that Russell. So let's go and look at some of the other charts. This is the S&P across the week. So you can see we did sell down, but we did get a bit of a bounce at the end of the week from that selling. It closed off its highs, so nothing really definitive there. I'm not seeing anything that suggests that this is necessarily the bottom. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a bit more, but look, it'll largely be down 
to what happens with the big tech stocks and how the market continues to treat them. And of course, we've got quite a few earnings next week that'll drive that. There's the equal weight S&P on a weekly chart. We've broken out and it was up just a little. And you can see there's certainly been a lot more money flowing around that trade than what we saw back here. A lot more interest. And there's the, there's the Russell on a weekly chart. So despite what happened in big tech, which is all you've probably read about, this is what was happening underneath the hood. And that's an extremely positive week. Look at the volumes around the last three weeks on the Russell since it broke out. This really is a very, very strong trade. So if we look at the NASDAQ on its own, so sharply down two weeks in a row, a little bit of a rebound on Friday, but nothing you could really hang your hat on at this stage. The semiconductors were certainly part of the selling, heavy selling on Wednesday and Thursday. We got a little bit of a bounce. NVIDIA, which I highlighted last week, also we bounced on Thursday from intraday lows. But Friday, we got a gap up, but then it traded down. So there's nothing really that you can hang your hat on there in terms of this being a reversal. So you would have to say with this sudden downward momentum, we've got lots of red candles, we've got gaps. You'd have to say that the potential for NVIDIA moving below $100 is in play. And if that's the case, then I think on a long-term view, that starts to come into very, very attractive territory. All right, let's look at some of the other spreads. There's the semiconductor versus the S&P. So you can see where there's definitely been uh, a significant shift. So if you're overweight in this area, then you should no longer be in that position. Looking at it on a relative basis over the banks actually did quite well as they did in Australia. Materials moved up, which is not what happened in Australia. Healthcare moved up. So in Australia, finance and healthcare were the best. So that reflects what was going on in America. Consumer staples uh, ticked up towards the end, but we saw uh, discretionary and then tech and communication services heading down quite strongly for the week. All right, if we look at the currencies, not a lot of movement in, uh, in the US dollar, but the Australian dollar did get sold off. So this is a weekly chart on the Australian dollar, it got sold off quite sharply with a big gap to start the week. So that helped the gold price somewhat. So turning to the Aussie market now, 6493 is where our dollar finished. Our index lost 0.6% across the week. Uh, don't really have a feel for how it's likely to trade on Monday. Banks and healthcare were up. Energy, real estate and materials were the largest decliners in the Australian market. But it was quite a resilient week for many of the stronger trends. A lot of the Insiders Club portfolio stocks were either stable or actually rose during the week. So there is still plenty of good news to be found if you know where to look. Precious metals, gold down $9 uh, to 2386. But in Australian dollars, because the currency effect, it actually went up to 3645. So very profitable territory. When we look globally, the producers are still struggling in what is a highly profitable environment. And I can only hope that as the uh, US gold majors report over the next few weeks, that we do see a response, a more positive response in the, uh, in the stock prices. But so far, not a lot happening there. Some of the local producers, some of the larger ones, Northern Star, Revolution Mining, they are trending. It, it's nothing spectacular, but they are trending higher, setting higher highs and higher lows. But there are several real gems in the local brigade providing pretty robust gains. So there's GDXJ on a weekly chart. So down for the second week in a row. And as I said, just hope that the weight of great results and profitability will get things moving there. Uh, if you look at Northern Star is one example on a weekly chart. Finished, uh, we were up the two previous weeks, finished down a little bit. But if you step back from September of last year, it is trending 
in the upwards uh, direction. So we do have some upward momentum. So there's the US dollar gold price on a weekly chart. So it's just zero in on that on a daily. So a bit of a turnaround, sold off heavily on Thursday, but did turn around and regained some of that on Friday. And in Australian dollars, looking pretty positive. All-time peak was set up here at just a tick under 3,800. Obviously helped at that time because the Australian dollar was down. But it certainly looks like it's, it's heading back up in that direction so that's the, uh, that is the gold market. <clears throat> Turning now to other commodities, copper was down sharply again. That's a, a real head scratcher. I have more to say on that. Nickel also down to 705. I think that copper is the big contrarian play. I can't explain why it's so weak when the outlook appears to be pretty robust. But I, you know, if you're looking out a couple of years, this looks one of the the better contrarian plays to me. Um, but you need to know how you, you're going to play it because it can be done many different ways through existing producers, through development stocks, and there are all manner of different development stocks from, uh, from advanced to high risk. And there are some factors that just make some stocks a lot better. And I talk about those in my services all the time. There are a couple of indicators that you can look for or a couple of factors that you can look for that give you an outsized advantage in the selection of copper stocks. And we've looked at that a few times over the last couple of weeks. You know, what's already working? There are some local copper stocks that are doing very, very well and why that is the case. Crude oil dropped from 82 down to 77. We'll look at that chart in just a minute. Just want to touch on lithium. It's pretty clear now we've got slowing demand. There is negativity in all sorts of areas. We certainly saw some negativity around the General Motors uh, earnings report. <clears throat> Their EV sales are, uh, are struggling. So we've definitely got slowing demand. We've got rising supply. So this is not a good balance. And it, it's apparent now that, that this could stretch on for multiple years. And that's certainly, it was very difficult to say that six or, or 12 months ago, certainly 12 months ago, you couldn't have said that. In the USA, the adoption of electric vehicles is falling. It's down to 7% in terms of growth. So that's not hitting in the right direction. Hybrids are being uh, favored and they use a lot less lithium. Europe is far higher, but Europe is heavily subsidized. And you would think that that is something that can't continue forever. So that's that's the base case. It's not what you would call a robust outlook for higher lithium prices. But then on the other hand, we've got PLS, who seems to be singing from a very different hymn book altogether. They've still got major expansion plans, and, and maybe this is just because their time horizon is five to 10 years, whereas uh, the, the market price around spodumene and around lithium chemicals is the next three months, six months. But PLS is still forging ahead. So they're obviously expressing enormous confidence in the long term. Their FY25 guidance is for 820,000 um, dry metric tons. I think there's something like 675 in FY24 at a cost of 675. Now the current spodumene price, which is a spot price, that's not necessarily the price that that PLS gains on sales is something between 850 and, and 920 last time I saw. So they've still got a margin to work with there. It's not like they're losing money. It was record volume in June, but the costs were rising and that was at 840. So that didn't help the market sentiment towards PLS and revenues, their volumes were up, production volumes were up, but the price had come off so sharply from a year ago that revenues actually fell nearly 70% year on year because, you know, prices have fallen nearly eightfold from their peak. But PLS still managed to find the confidence to provide guidance, which is really a big statement because, you know, I don't think the market was looking for guidance. They, the market understands how uncertain the future is in lithium, and yet PLS 
provided guidance. So that, you know, that is a, a real tick. So which one is right? Is the market right? Is PLS right? Are they both right? And it's just a timing difference. I, look, I really don't know the answer, but I, I know that right now you need to be extremely underweight in lithium and there will be an opportunity building, but I don't have any feel for the timing around that. So you just want to be quite patient with lithium. Other commodities, quickly on uranium, currently now down to 82. We're at 106 and now we're down to 82. Certainly the enthusiasm for uranium has cooled off dramatically. And this is definitely one to play by the cycles. So let's just take a look at a chart that reflects that. So URA got up here to almost 33, but we've now uh, backed right off down to 27 and a half. And that's happened in the last uh, six or seven weeks, just when it seemed like uranium stocks would just keep trending up and up and up. Uh, it was a case of too much too soon. Uranium prices come off and this has backed off quite significantly. But look, you're, again, uranium's not going away. It's got into a lull. Is that three months, two years? Who knows? But uranium will be back. So this is definitely one for the watch list. There's the spot copper chart. So you can see it's come off quite sharply. Uh, more on that in just a minute. There's nickel also doing something similar. So it was a pretty nasty week for commodities. And there's crude oil also backed off as well. Wrapping it all up, rotation in the cycles. We haven't seen a lot of rotation over the last year or two. It was just a one-way street, money pouring into big tech and everything else being sort of left behind. But now the normal cyclical rotation is back and it's back big time as you saw at the start. And the key thing here is be alert to the extremes of sentiment. You know, don't be late as these cycles rotate. If you've done well out of cycles that have gone up strongly, then... You need to get out and capture some of that profit and get yourself into other areas that are starting to trend. But if you try to do it by just a gut feel, you know, stick, stick your finger in the air and try and guess it at when, you're either going to be too early or too late. It, it's just pure luck if you got anywhere near the peaks of these extremes. So you need something to guide you other than gut feeling. Now, you look at what was hot. Over the last couple of years, obviously lithium was, now it's not. Uranium was, and definitely off the boil. Critical minerals seemed unassailable two years ago, and now most critical minerals development stocks are, you know, almost on their knees. AI was definitely hot. It's, I think it's going to remain hot, but it was probably just too far in, in price, so we're getting an adjustment. So these are all parts of the market, and there are others that have reached extremes. But as I said, if you're trying to pick the top based on what feels right, it's just, it's not going to work. There are also emerging trends. There are numerous niche businesses, and I'm talking Australia here now, but also in America, in, in the non-mining area that cover technology, the medical field, industrial, discretionary. It's really across the board. These are niche stocks that have terrific management and they've got a really good position in their market. They've got pricing power and some of them are, have been trending for the last six or 12 months. So there are numerous opportunities as, uh, as well. But what you need is a process to identify, first of all, that we are seeing a shift, a rotation, and then to be able to exploit that rotation. So it's got to be process driven. You, you can't do it by gut feel. You'll just, you'll be far too early or far too late. If you're far too early, you'll leave too much money on the table. And if you're far too late, you'll just get too much money back. Because these extremes can last far longer than what is reasonable. You know, you think about what people have been saying for a long time about NVIDIA, that it couldn't, just couldn't keep rising the way that it was. And yet it did. So there was a great deal of money to be made in those tech stocks if you didn't get out too early. This is the process that I talk about all the time. You need to monitor a broad, so across all sectors of the market, because you never know what's going to be next. So it needs to be a broad look at the market, and it needs to be a very deep watch list. You, you need to have a, many, many stocks 
uh, on your horizon. Don't get caught up in the crowd hype. Don't buy into the enthusiasm. Now, that's difficult to do unless you're immersed in the market constantly as I am. So I recognize that that's an issue for most people. But the key thing is don't take your cues from the media. Don't get caught up in in what the, the current hot theme is. You know, that, that's probably something that you can try and avoid doing. Your entry style needs to accommodate your appetite for risk. You don't have to only do things the, the one way. You can modify your style according to what your particular risk needs uh, are going to be. Build weightings to a plan. Have, you know, have a plan around what, what sort of weightings you're going to allocate to each sector, to each stock. Um, and you need then a clear and repeatable exit and profit-taking plan because that, that's where you get your timing uh, far more accurate. You let the market take you out rather than making a decision that a stock, which has been rising, has gone far enough. So let the market take you out. Don't get greedy because there are so many opportunities. I get questions from members and from non-members uh, that they don't want to get out of a stock that they've done really well out of, even though the signs are there, because they think that that's the only stock they can make money out of. You know, it's not so. There are so many opportunities. You don't have to milk a particular trend for everything that it's got to offer. Be happy just to take a slice of what has been a very strong trend. And then when the risk and reward starts to shift, move into something else. You know, this is just about making money. This is not about owning a particular stock and trying to get the most out of it. You've just got to shift your thinking. Let the market action take you in and take you out. Because that's how you make your money. The prices move up or down. It's not necessarily because you get in when the fundamentals are most attractive. That timing can be completely wrong at times. Portfolio Analyst last week was about building your trading plan, the just you know, simple trading plans, clarity around that process. It, it's how you consistently do well in the market. We also looked at the outlook for EV sales and also not getting, not zeroing in on certain things that, are, that appeal to you or that fit your view of the world. Using all the information to make informed decisions, even if some of it is, is pointing in a direction that you don't like. You know, it might be pointing against a stock that you don't particularly want to get out of, but if the information is there, then you need to act on it. So it was a good session in Portfolio Analyst last week. That's it for this rundown. There's more information on the website. There's my email address. I'll be back with you next Sunday. Cheers.